Hi everybody, welcome back to the 10th of an hour with Griffin Bridgers. For today's episode, episode 90, we're going to look at a recent private letter ruling where a broker referral fee rebate was deemed to not be included in the gross income of the recipient of that rebate, a buyer of real estate, and it was deemed to not impose any sort of 1099 filing requirement on behalf of the uh, company paying the referral fee. Now that seems to be a very narrow type of uh, discussion here, but we're going to kind of broaden that out to look in general at the concept of uh, purchase price reductions and a 30,000 foot view of what those might consist of and what effects they might have uh, with respect to a recipient of any sort of reduction like that. Now, as always, this presentation is for education purposes only and it's not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice. So for those of you who are students of income tax, you may recall the adage that income from whatever source derived is subject to income tax as gross income. However, there are some sources of income that are expressly excluded from gross income by code provision. Those include things like gifts and inheritances, or a return of basis, or even life insurance proceeds that are not subject to the transfer for value rule. However, sometimes there can be non-apparent ways in which income is excluded from gross income. One might be a purchase price reduction. So let's say maybe you, you uh, have purchased something and then closed the transaction and then after the fact uh, it's determined that you overpaid and the seller is nice enough to refund a portion of your purchase price. In that case, the rebate you receive back or the refund you receive back would not be income to you because it's really just reducing the purchase price that you paid for that asset. And this concept was recently applied to a real estate referral platform in uh, private letter ruling 2020-47002. In this private letter ruling, what happened is the, the taxpayer in question was a real estate brokerage that had an online referral platform that was run through a subsidiary. So this would have been some sort of probably like a, a listing service or uh, a company like Zillow or somebody like that who, who had real estate listings on there. And the intent was that buyers who were interested in purchasing real estate could go into that platform. And if interested, they could sign up to participate in a program where if they see real estate they like under this uh, platform and and they agree to be referred to a broker uh, through that platform in order to close the transaction on the real estate that they are interested in, then that broker would pay a referral fee to this platform and then the platform would keep a cut and then send the rest of the referral fee back to the buyer as an incentive to use the platform and uh, by implication to use this broker service as well. Now what happened here is that this platform or the administrator of the platform, the broker, sought a ruling to deem that the referral fees paid back to the buyers of real estate um, did not uh, become gross income uh, through that payment. And really the concern here was that not necessarily that the buyers would have gross income, but more that the platform didn't want the annual filing requirement of having to issue 1099s to each buyer who received a referral fee back. Now, depending on the volume, that could have been, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of 1099s that have to be, that have to be issued each year. And that would be a huge compliance burden. So, so what happened here is that the IRS agreed. Uh, what the uh, platform was seeking was a ruling that this was really akin to a purchase price reduction or a refund or rebate. And the IRS agreed looking at a, a number of prior cases and guidance where they had looked at rebates, refunds, and purchase price reductions to deem that those are not included in gross income. Now importantly, what this ruling revolved around wasn't necessarily the gross income uh, aspect, but more, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the compliance aspect of not having to issue a 1099. So generally, whenever you as a payor make payments of $600 or more, more to any person for the year, uh, you have to issue them a 1099 and also provide a copy to the IRS as well. 
However, this 1099 requirement is waived when the entire payment to a person is excluded from their gross income. And that was the case here. The entire referral fee was excluded from gross income, so there was no requirement to issue a 1099 on behalf of the platform for the referral fees uh, being paid out. However, with a traditional purchase price reduction, you'd probably still have uh, a 1099 that you'd have to have issued uh, the, the big question is whether you'd have to still issue it if the refund took the total payment under $600. And most likely what would happen is uh, you'd have to amend the 1099 if you first reported it, then made the refund after the fact. But there's a whole lot of ways the waters could be muddied here. So I want you to kind of keep in mind that this ruling is narrowly focused on a situation where the entire payment that could be subject to a 1099 is excluded from from gross income. That's the situation in which the 1099 requirement could be waived, not a situation where a part of the payment could be excluded from gross income. Now there's some other tidbits I want you to keep in mind, and I'm going to kind of go in reverse order on this page, because one item I want to note that wasn't necessarily mentioned in this ruling and often escapes recognition is the fact that when you do have a purchase price reduction, uh, your cost basis is equal to the purchase price that you actually pay. So as a result, if you have a reduction to your purchase price, you also must reduce your basis in the property by the amount of that rebate or refund or purchase price reduction. Now there's a couple other code sections where purchase Purchase price reductions are specifically called out. One is uh, with discharge of indebtedness income. Usually if you have debt forgiven, it could be income to you as the debtor, but uh, in a situation where maybe it's purchase money debt, in other words, where the seller carries the note and the seller forgives a part of that note as a purchase price reduction, then that would not be income to you, but would require that adjustment to basis like I just mentioned. Another situation could be under code section 83, where the payment of property in lieu of cash in a compensatory type of arrangement could become subject to income tax when there is no longer uh, a substantial risk of forfeiture or when the property vests. And in order to head that off, the recipient can make uh, an 83B election to treat the entire property as taxable. Now, if the recipient purchases that property from their employer, uh, there there's a, a likelihood that a reduction of the purchase price, or especially if there's a, a, a carried note, like I just mentioned under 108, uh, could be compensatory income. However, uh, the way the regs are worded, you may be able to escape that and treat it as a purchase price reduction so long as the 83B election has been made. Otherwise, the Treasury regulations directly state that a reduction of that indebtedness would be compensatory income to the employee in that sort of a situation. Now, by no means is this list all inclusive, but this kind of highlights some, some areas where this can come into play. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. But thank you for listening to this episode of the 10th of an hour, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.